Well, as we get into the new year and the month of January, we have uh, kicked it off with a bang, so to speak, across the U.S. with a large winter storm system that has worked through over the last several days. And we're going to see more impacts here in a fairly active pattern, potentially, as we go through this first month of the year. Plus, we want to get an update on some of the dryness concerns in South America that are starting to develop Let's take a look at all of this. Joining us now, Eric Snodgrass with Conduit. Eric, good to chat with you, my friend. Happy New Year. Thanks for being with us. And uh, man, oh, man, what a uh, – I looked at the all-hazards weather map over the weekend. Extremely <laughs> colorful from yeah. essentially Kansas to the East Coast. Yeah, and, and a blizzard in Kansas, ice storm in Kansas, a cut across Missouri, hit the southern you know, half of Illinois pretty hard. Indiana, it's moving into the Mid-Atlantic today. And – What's interesting is this storm will be gone by late this afternoon. It's going to be off the coast. It never made the turn up the coast. But in its wake, some really cold air is in place, very strong winds. We're going to blow a lot of that snow around. But, you know, Jesse, as I think about it, there was a lot of water in this. And it hit some places that needed it. And because the soils weren't, like, completely frozen across that kind of, you know, that area south of 40 degrees north, this is going to be, a, I think, a net benefit to the overall water health of that of that area. Uh, so I'm just thinking like bigger picture, like what are we going to be talking about come May? Like, oh, that winter storm, well, it was terrible and caused a tremendous amount of car accidents and ice. You know, it was really, really quite bad. It may have been one that helped to uh, alleviate some longer term drought stress. And you know that I've been worried about drought stress going into 2025. So this is, you know, just part of that ongoing discussion. Absolutely. And I was interested, you mentioned the ice and the snow totals and more that we saw, but you know, kind of on the southern side of this, we had some severe weather, some heavy rain in the mid-south, the deep south, but even snow potential in Texas here, I mean, I mean this has been a very dynamic system. It has. And yeah, so that, that's that's another interesting part. So you're right. We had severe weather over the weekend. We had, what, 35 reports of damage, uh, including five tornadoes. And then don't forget, two Saturdays ago, we had an outbreak down in the lower Mississippi River Valley that I believe up to this point, they may have adjusted. I'm just remembering the numbers here, but like 90 reports of tornadoes. That's That's one of the busiest days of all of 2024, believe it or not. And we're not done yet. So there's a system that's curling its way up very soon. It'll be about two, two and a half days from now. It's going to curl up over the Baja. Now, this is why it's important. It's going to bring moisture into Mexico, New Mexico, Arizona, West Texas. Now, those are areas I've been watching just get drier and drier and drier. This doesn't break the drop, but it stops the bleeding temporarily in that area. But there's so much cold air that's diving in behind the system today that as this new one forms, it's going to overrun that colder air. So we're talking about Texas, uh, parts of Arkansas, um, Oklahoma, that are going to be getting some snow. And this system could spread some more snow in the Midwest and could also spread it all the way over to the East Coast. Um, it's not going to hit the Southeast, but I, I think there's more snow in this. So I think what's going to be interesting this year compared to a year ago is we're having a more legitimate winter overall now that we've gotten into January. And I don't think this is going to slow down. I think I'm, it's not going to be it's where it's just nonstop chaos for weeks mm -hmm. on end. But it looks as though from now through mid-February that we are going to be getting into an active jet stream pattern. It's even going to shift a bit. We're going to push things around to where the flow comes even better out of the West, which could result in um, you know more of these active systems. Maybe we pin it down to one to two a week, which could be important. I mean, and reality, Jesse, with all of this is just when the flow returns, which it's doing now, we can pack moisture into places that are dry. And given that right now my risk into 2025 throughout the plains and Midwest of drought developing is six and 10, I think it's a 60% chance based off historical analogs. Um, this could be a step in a direction to, to kind of alleviate some of that longer term worry, but it's going to boil down to several things. And I'll be honest with you, I was doing some work late last night, looking very closely at the uh, ocean temperatures in the North Pacific, specifically in the Gulf of Alaska, because I've always thought that if it gets colder and colder and colder there, we tend to have bigger and bigger drought risk. And that's what you'd see most commentary. But the reality is this it doesn't matter in winter. It's what happens from June 10th. This is interesting from June 10th through the end of August. If during that time period alone, those ocean temperatures cool off, then we're looking at a big drought scenario next year. So at this point, 
What we're really just watching is La Nina, which has likely already reached its peak. We're just going to watch what happens to it over the next month as it kind of maintains that plateau, then starts to die into February very, very quickly. But remember, La Nina, when you think about summer weather, uh, it's not the dominant factor. It's just not. So uh, all of that is mouthful for me, but it's just the things we're watching and why these storms right now are so important active pattern the cold air i should just ask real quick how yeah. long do we anticipate this cold air to stick around the u.s yeah this is funny by the time you get to the end of this week we're going to have the cold air in the midwest it's going to be all across the east and all across the south but coming out of the canadian prairie believe it or not are some temperatures that will invade the northern plains later this week that'll be in the low 30s so there could be times where it's colder in texas or in the mid-south where you are then it will be in the Red River Valley of the North this week, just because of how dynamic the push of cold air is getting into the southeastern United States. But what I'm really watching is I'm watching for the whole thing to flip around. I, I, I would rather have heat in the southeast and cold in the northwest, because then that drives a jet stream pattern out of the southwest United States, right in between the two, which cranks off systems and really beats backdrop concern, because that brings moisture all the way back to the western plains where they desperately need it. All right, let's talk South America. We've been seeing dryness develop in Argentina and stretching into southern Brazil a little bit, and it's something that's not a full-blown concern, I think, for some folks, but it's it's starting to be talked about. So what's the latest you're watching in terms of this uh, drought development there in South America? Yeah, I had a few folks uh, last week who, you know, are, are looking for causes for market movement. And some of the forecasts last week, of course, came out quite dry for southern Brazil and into Argentina. All right. Um, what do I think about it? December wasn't dry for southern Brazil. Right. So so you could you go a few weeks of dryness, two weeks? Sure. Well, my story is simply this. If it's the 25th of January, you fast forward from now to the 25th, 20 days from now and I'm still talking about dryness in Southern Brazil, then we've got a story. We've got something that's saying, hey, we're starting to stress this crop uh, and we need to pay attention to it. Uh, Argentina, okay, it's it's dry now, but even this weekend, storm snuck through central Argentina. The forecast was bone dry, storm still popped. It's midsummer, it's like the Midwest, right? You get pop-up storms. Um, but Argentina, I think would be a bit more on the more vulnerable side. Temperatures there are starting to crank. So if they get hot and dry, then the combination is not good. I don't think it's going to matter until we get past, I'd say, well past the middle of the month toward the 20th to 25th. And if we're still having this narrative then, then there's going to be some concern. And is there some realistic expectation of that? Yeah. The MGO slowed down. The slower it goes, the longer this pattern hangs on. What is also interesting with this, Jesse, is how wet it is across the center west, Goyas, Tocantins, over toward uh, Minas Gerais and Bahia. Like the, the northern growing areas are soaked in this pattern. And I wonder if that's going to cause the crop to stay greener longer and create issues for harvest, which should be beginning in some places very, very soon. So the market is watching South America, looking for something to drum up a weather scare. And I'm watching it too. Just, I would just say this, the Southern Brazilian states, which they're watching most carefully, NDVI values are still higher than the 20 year average, higher than the 20 year envelope as well. So it's going to take some time to cause some problems down there. All right. Any other notes from South America or elsewhere around the world that you are watching this week? Well, I'm going to ask you a question, Jesse. And I, I didn't prep you with this, but you know, last night I'm I'm in, I'm coming in from this conference and we're I'm sitting. I'm like I'm going to jump on Twitter and then I read all the stuff about Trudeau. What's been the what's what might that do, man? If you if know, designs. <laughs> it's hard to say. I I'm still waiting to to see the final result here, but it seems like all indications are that uh, Trudeau is going to step down and and. You know, with the uh, with the wild and wacky world of uh, politics we have in front of us, and trade negotiations and more, um, cue it up as another unexpected wrinkle. I guess is what I would classify well, that's just it, as it. Right? I mean, we know we have Trump coming into office, and we've got Trudeau leaving, and that that is way different from Trump's first term. And we know what happened with you know you know, what used to be called NAFTA, right? All that changed. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious what your thoughts were because I'm getting pinged all left and right this way. And I'm like, I don't, I don't do geopolitics, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm going to no, cue it up as, a, as just a, another wacky piece of the puzzle. That's, that's the best thing I can say. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree, but uh, could be an interesting week. Could see some volatility, I think just because of news, right? So we'll yeah. watch uh, the weather side of it. You keep your eye on everything else and 
we'll talk next Monday. <laughs> very true. Very true. News, weather, and we got a USDA report coming up at the end of the week as well. It's oh, going to be a very yeah. big one on Friday. I know folks can find more on the weather at uh, ag-wx.com, agweather.com. Eric Snodgrass with Conduit. Always good to talk with you, my friend. Thanks for being with us, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. All right. See you, Jesse.